Well, I salute each and every one with the honorable blessing words of grace, mercy, and peace. May they be multiplied unto you this evening uh, as we're here in another Bible study. And tonight we begin a new journey. We begin a new chapter um, that we're about to press into, which is Revelation chapter 14. Amen. Revelation chapter 14. For those who may have received the notes by email or those who have looked online uh, through social media regarding tonight's Bible study, uh, even as this is called chapter 14, uh, if I could entitle this chapter, I will call it Reaping of the Harvest. Once again, Reaping of the Harvest. And, and many people uh, should be able to get a revelation on that title as we begin to get deeper into this chapter. Uh, as I always say, even from Revelation chapter 1 up until now, I like to keep the harmony line going uh, all the way through the book because we never know who may be new listening and tying in. And I want to make sure that there's a, a thing of clarity that stays um in sync with what everybody is getting. Amen. I want to make sure that there, there is a harmony line of understanding uh, that people are able to hold on to. Uh, as I state that, once again, I remind people what the book is all about. Once again, the book is entitled Revelation, which comes from the Greek word apocalypsis. Uh, and as we have said from chapter one to now, apocalypsis means to reveal or to have uncovered. However, I always remind everybody there's two Greek words for uh, revelation there's apocalypsis and there's what's called apocalypto um, the difference in the two is that the apocalypto is the revealing in the process amen as we know on a day-to-day -day basis when we learn something new and we have as we say an aha moment we're like wow okay what happens is you've had an apocalypto but once you have learned that thing and got it embedded within you and you're able to go back and tell the story of what you learned, it becomes an apocalypsis. So John the Revelator in, in the, the Hebraic tongue, uh, uh, Yohanan, uh, he, he gives us this book called Revelation, which is his apocalypsis of Jesus Christ or Yeshua. As we read Revelations chapter one, it says this is the revelation or this is the apocalypsis of Yeshua or Jesus Christ. This is the revealing of who he is. Amen. And as we have transitioned from chapter to chapter, verse to verse, we began to see a panoramic view of a vision that John is given on the Isle of Patmos. Amen. As we transition from chapter one with the revealing of who, who Jesus is, the description of him, we transitioned into a place that we began to get into the details of of uh, the churches. Amen. John had a letter to the angels of the seven churches of Asia. As we understand angel, and I bring that back to your remembrance for those who have been part of this study, angel coming from the Greek word agalos, which means messenger. Amen. So, we began to understand that the messengers that were dealt with with the seven churches were dealing with the pastors or the overseers or the bishops that had been put in place. Amen. So then we began to transition into the 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 the, the, the people whose blood had been spilt into the earth and the the twenty four elders and the beasts that were seen, the four living creatures. Uh, we transitioned from there. To to begin to see about uh, uh, the seven angels and, and their specific assignments as they have impacted the earth. Amen. But now keep this in mind. I will say this again to still hold the harmony line. I want everybody to know even as we continue forward, we're coming from a spiritual understanding of the book. Amen. A lot of people have, have gotten enough or in-depth uh, uh, knowledge and understanding of the book of Revelation. Revelation from the literal, but God is telling me to groom you and grow you uh, in the spiritual. There's some spiritual maturity that God wants us to have when we look at the book of Revelation about Jesus in this aspect. Amen. 
So as we continue here, uh, uh, it tr- we transitioned from from dealing with with the seven angels and dealing with the beast and the mark of the beast that was here in chapter thirteen to bring us to tonight, Revelation chapter fourteen. Amen. So for those that have the word of the Lord with them, please turn with me to Revelation chapter fourteen. If there's any of you that may be dialed into the conference line by the internet. Uh, you should be able to see the notes for this chapter uh, on the screen. Amen. So with that being said, I'm not going to prolong the time with with uh, too much of the crash course of what we've already covered because there's still a lot of more meat. There's still a lot more that God wants us to have as we get deeper into this book. Amen. So let me begin uh, reading Revelations chapter 14, verse one. And it says, and I looked And lo, a lamb stood on the Mount of Zion and with him a hundred forty and four thousand having his father's name written in their foreheads. Amen. Let's take time to begin to dissect this verse. All right. John begins to write here in this chapter and he says, and I looked. Uh, I remind you, the Greek word for look is ido, which means to see, perceive, or to know. So John says, I began to see something or, or not only see it, but I began to perceive. I began to draw a perception in order to be in the know, in order to be in understanding. He says, and lo, a lamb. So he says, what I'm looking at is a lamb. I see it. I perceive it and I began to understand what it is. So he sees a lamb and the Greek word for lamb is onion, which means little lamb. Okay. Uh, I began to think about that, you know, as we have been on this journey with the book of Revelation and, and I began to get a little bit more understanding here uh, as it articulates the lamb. Watch this. Could it be as we're understanding uh, uh, Christ is being articulated as a lamb because he's a small version of the father, i.e. he is a another version that John is seeing to associate with the dispatched version of the father. Anything that comes out of the father is smaller than the father himself. The father is already articulated as being the one and all. He is, as we say in the old church, my all in all. So, so in that God is bigger than everything, but when it comes to anything that comes out of him, that comes into the the perception of the natural eye, y'all got to hear what I'm saying right now. Anything that can come into the perception of the natural eye conduces itself in a way that the eye can see it. Amen. So the lamb is only God being, uh, uh, reduced into something that can be conceived by man. Okay. So John says, I saw the lamb that stood on the mount. Okay. Now he stood on, watch this, not just a mount, but he stood on Mount Zion. Let me refresh your memory. When we talk about standing here in, in, in the Greek as to what the book of revelation, where understanding was translated from stand or stood is histomai, which means not only to stand, but, but to establish. So John says, I perceived a version of God that was a lamb that was innocent. And in seeing that version of God that was innocent, it was established, meaning Watch this. We ain't talking about just standing up on his feet, but it was established because you got to understand, even when we stand, it, it prophetically symbolizes establishment. OK, so the lamb or this version of God was established on Mount Zion. All right. Now, I began to, to, to do a little research, amen, before tonight's Bible study. And I found some very interesting thing because we have hazardly as believers talk about Mount Zion. We, we throw the terminology around, but you know, I, I, I fail to hear many people that have done some homework when we talk about Zion. 
Amen. So uh, in that, um, um, what we began to look at is the fact of the mount. Hold, hold one minute, everybody. Hold, hold one minute. Amen, 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 amen. Hopefully everybody can hear a little bit clearer now. Okay, amen, amen. So it talks about the mount. Let me, let me clarify the, the mount Zion for you. The word mount comes from the Greek word oros. Oros means to rise, to rear up, or is a, acknowledging a hill, a higher point. Okay, so now the lamb is established on the high point. Okay, but now what high point is articulated other than Zion? Okay, now it is, uh, uh, let, let, let me deal with Zion here for a minute. Amen. For those who really want some revelation, the word Zion in Hebrew means fortification or raised up as a monument. OK, now by scripture, for what we know of today, Zion is in correlation to Jerusalem. All right. Which is the hill where David established the citadel. And see, for those who who really are learning something, watch this. David establishing the citadel is where we actually get our term city from. City is only an abbreviation of the term citadel. OK, so now to 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 go back and 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 see where all this is referenced for those that have the Bible with them. I'll give you these scriptures. I won't go and look into all of them, but Zion is referenced in Psalms 87 verse two through three. Hebrews 12 verse 22 and also in first Peter chapter two verse six. All right. Now, what's very interesting, however, when we talk about the literal place of Zion, as we know, which is the city where Jerusalem is now, uh, it has history that goes back further that ties itself even to the Canaan land. When you read 2 Samuel 5, 7, uh, it was the first stronghold that was taken by the people. It was a Canaanite fortress. Amen. So now if I even go back a little bit further than that, this is what I found that was very profound as I began to do my homework on Zion is also the term Zion is a name that is two cultures pulled together. It's both Hebrew and Egyptian, i.e. the term Zai is Hebrew, meaning barren place. All right. On is the original name of the Egyptian holy city, Heliopolis. Okay, to bag it up, when you go to Genesis chapter uh, 41, verse 45, it talks about Joseph married Potiphar's daughter. His daughter was from the city of On. On, i.e. Heliopolis, or i.e. the second half of Zion. So Zion ties itself to both Hebrew as well as Egyptian or Kemet culture. Amen. Now, some people may be saying, Apostle, you, you, you're kind of getting into something that I'm, uh, 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 I'm kind of defensive on in, in my theology or thinking because wasn't Egypt the ones that had all the gods in the Old Testament? And yes, that is so. However, we should not be in the posture to judge Egypt because in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 19 verse 22, God talks about striking Egypt, but then he also uh, talks about healing it as well. Amen. If, if I can turn there just for a moment, because I just found this very fascinating as we talk about Zion, or should I say the body of Christ doesn't do enough talking about Zion or the history of Zion. So in Isaiah chapter 19 verse 22, uh, and it states, 
uh, and the Lord will strike Egypt. He will strike and heal it. They will return to the Lord and he will be entreated by them and heal them. Okay, so just because we're, I'm bringing to your attention some things about Egypt, we can't dismiss Egypt uh, because of our religiosity, i.e. we cannot put ourselves in the posture of being a judge of a people just because of what the record said. Because in that, then technically we say and God can't bring salvation or deliverance to a people that's disobedient. However, we live in a, in a disobedient state against God on a day to day basis. Uh, hello, I hope somebody heard me right there. What I'm just saying is there's some significant things about Egypt because, you know, uh, and I'm not trying to do a, a, a full lesson on Egypt tonight, but I have to bring this backdrop into the picture in order for you to understand the significance of Zion. Um, in the same turn, even when we go back to the cultural understanding of how Egypt came into the picture, some of us have to have to uh, do a little bit of our homework and begin to understand uh, if it wasn't for Noah. Basically, Egypt wouldn't have come into existence because Egypt is only the descendants of Noah's son, Ham. Ham's true name is Kemet. Uh, Ham is only our Americanized name that we have here in the English translation. But Noah's son, or Utnafishtim in the ancient uh, Sumerian, as to his name, son Kim or Ham went and established what we know as Kemet or Egypt. Okay, so that meant even the Egyptians began under Hebraic culture or out of ancient Sumer, amen, or Sumerian. So now, with that being said, with that being said, let me let me reel this back in. And, and bring us back on focus here with this very first verse. So once again, John says, uh, I was able to perceive and understand the lamb, uh, 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 the version of God, i.e. the Christ that was established on Mount Zion that, that watch this began there and still ends there or, or had a, 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 a earthbound starting there and is still present even in the time of John. And he says, and with him, 144,000 having his father's name uh, written in their foreheads. Okay, watch this. It not only says or talks about uh, uh, the lamb being on Mount Zion, which is of the ancient of days, which even goes back to ancient Jerusalem that goes back uh, to its roots out of Egypt to tie it to the city of David or the citadel of David. We also see that it says that the 144,000 and, and for those that was with the Bible study, when we looked at Revelation chapter seven, chapter seven or the perfecting chapter dealt with the, the 12 tribes. And as we had a revelation about the 12 tribes, we began to understand that the tribes were named after characters or characteristics. So out of those characteristics of those being delivered, we, we really got, got a real revelation there that, that there, there's some characteristics that are within people that have been yoked to tribes or have been identified with specific names, have been mantled with certain character that they had to be delivered. So out of that, because remember, Number 12 is the number of government. It's the number of foundation. So out of the 144,000, they were symbolizing 12,000 of 12 tribes. So the, the number of foundation and government and order is being uh, 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 echoed prophetically in the presence of the lamb as to what John is seeing. He's, he's seeing all these numbers of people. Amen. And then the scripture says, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Okay, let me take a minute to even begin to deal with that. It says these 144,000 had the fathers. And remember, the word father comes from the Greek word pater. All right. We're not talking about the Arabic name for God, which is Abba or father. We're talking about father or pater in the sense of a generator. 
Okay, meaning one who has a seed to parent or replicate themselves. See, understand the 144,000 have been born again, i.e. they have been replicated or regenerated uh, uh, to represent the father with the son. Okay, let me say that again. They have been regenerated into representing the father Pater with the son, meaning the generator, the, the one that they, 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 they created them, i.e. spiritually. Now they're in standing or in right standing with their joint heir, i.e. if we can say brother or what we're connected to as the Christ. OK, so the scripture says the father's name was written in their foreheads. Now, let me say this. Let me remind those that are listening to tie this in. Once again, the scripture says that the name understand the Greek word for name is anoma, which anoma means designation or i.e. character. So the hundred and forty four thousand have the character of. Oh God written in their foreheads now to write let me let me let me make sure you have this clear the scripture says right the word right comes from the Greek word grapho grapho means to write but it also means to describe okay so by the scripture it's saying that uh, um, the character of God is described within them. Okay? The character of God is described within them. Now, as the, the character of God is described, it means uh, 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 um, written or built within their minds. Why do I say that? Other than when you turn to Psalms 119 verse 11, the word says uh, or speaks of hiding the word in your heart. OK, to hide it in your heart means to hide it in your head or hide it in your thoughts. The word the word heart in Hebrew is lab. In the Greek, it's cardia, but it means the place of decision making or the place of thoughts. So what the scripture says is hide it in your thoughts, hide it in your mind. So when the word is hidden within the mind, it becomes engrafted in the mind. It becomes part of the mind. So the bottom line is it says the hundred and forty four thousand. Uh, who had the name of the father in their forehead means that the 144,000 had the characteristic uh, engrafted in their thinking. It became part of who they were. It became part of how they thought. It became part of how they operated. It became part of how they moved. And so it, it, it now sits in the forehead and the forehead is the cerebral. It is as the Egyptians used to call it the third eye. It's the place of thinking. It is the discerning point. It is the place, as I tell people, the throne seat of God. Because understand, if God operates in our thoughts, or i.e. in our suke, or our soul. So it requires something to be in the mind in order for God to be there. Amen? So as I began to understand this, as I begin to understand it, it now brings us to, to verse two. And it says, and I heard, and I heard uh, a voice. Amen. I heard a voice. The scripture says, I heard a voice. Now, in the hearing of the voice. Amen. In the hearing of the voice, it says, I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. All right. Now, John says here in verse two, he says, I heard a voice. Okay. Now, 
in the hearing, he's saying not only did he audibly hear, but he said he understood. Okay, because the Greek word for hear is a kuo, which means not only to just hear, he wasn't just listening, but he was truly listening within his spirit, meaning he was understanding. So the scripture says a voice uh, from heaven as the voice of many waters. So he says that there was a voice. And when we talk about voice, the word voice is phone or phone, which means sound, tone, reverberation or frequency. So John says in his understanding, he began to get on the right frequency. He began to to hear a sound. He began to hear something uh, that now brings him to a place of understanding. I uh, hope somebody is hearing me right there. Uh, 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 he's brought to a place of understanding. So now in his place of understanding, the scripture says that he heard a voice from heaven. Now it wasn't a voice from anywhere. It says that the voice or the frequency or the sound came from Oranos, came from the sky, came from space, came from heaven, came from a place in his surrounding. All right. And it says as the voice of many waters. Now in that John says, I heard a sound uh, uh, that's coming out of the heavens, but it was so enormous. It was so massive. It was so broad that in the hearing of it, John is basically telling you that it was un, un under, you you couldn't understand it. It was like a crashing noise because as he says, it came as the sound of many waters. If anybody has been by water, especially a waterfall, if anybody has ever come by a stream, if everybody anybody has gone by the rapids, uh, uh, rivers, fast running water, the noise is so great that you can't even comprehend or watch this, hear anything else. Hear what I'm saying. What happens is the noise is so great that it drowns out any other sound. So John says, I hear a frequency. I hear a voice that's of so, so much of a magnitude of a sound that it drowned it everything else out. He says in the same turn, he said it was as thunder. So it, 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 it spoke with power. All right. So now what's interesting is in the verse, there's a colon. And he said, I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. OK, so now he says the sound or the frequency was profound. The sound and the frequency was not only profound, but it, 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 it commanded authority because understand for everybody that's listening, anybody that's been around when a thunderstorm has happened. Every time we've heard the thunder, thunder crack and the lightning uh, 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 crack through the sky as well. We begin to come to attention because there's a reverence. There is there is a, there is an honor and a respect and a fear that we give of what God does in the supernatural or what God allows to happen for us to hear and to see. Amen. So, so in that John says here that it's a thunderous sound, but yet it's a great sound. And then he turns around and then there's a colon in the verse and it says, and I heard the voice of harpers. All right. Now, when he says he, he heard the voice of harpers, harper is, is katherados, which means a harpist or a player. And it says harping with their harps. Uh, so now in that they're they're harping, but it's articulating to the fact that it was as a, uh, a musical ensemble. It was something of praise and worship that was unto God. Verse three says, and they sung as it were a new song before the throne. And before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song, but the hundred and forty and four thousand, which were redeemed from the earth. All right. So the scripture says that they sung a song. All right. Now, in the singing of this song, uh, the word song or song that's there is Edo, which means uh, singing of praise or praise singing. Okay. Now in their praise singing, it was as it were a new song. 
Let, let me articulate something here. Okay. Now, when it says it was as a new song, you understand there's two Greek words for new. There's kainos and then there's neos. All right. New that's being used in the verse is kainos, which means brand new, unused or fresh. Uh, that's like making something out of nothing, something that's never been heard before. OK, the other terminology in the Greek is neos, which means to renew or renovate. OK, two different words, but uh, imply the same thing in our English dialect. What we say as new, we have to understand uh, from the Greek translation, uh, you got to make sure you're using the right one. Because see, neos is the term that would use we use once again to renovate or to renew. I.e., for instance, when Paul says, and God shall create a new heaven and a new earth. The new that's used in that verse is not kainos, meaning to create from nothing. It's the word neos, which means to renovate, means to 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 make over or cosmetic, do cosmetic work. Amen. As somebody, you know, for you to be able to grab this. Uh, the thing is, if if your brakes stop working on your car, you don't get rid of the car and get a whole new one. You just do cosmetic work of replacing the brakes so that the brakes on, on the car that you got work. So neos is a terminology of cosmetic work. OK, Kanos, however, here is talking about brand new. So this is a jam that don't nobody else know. Y'all got to get what I'm saying. I'm trying to trying to keep this in reality for you to grab. So there's the John is saying that the, the, the song is something that he's never heard before. And the thing is, it's a song that everybody can catch because the thing is, the song is only relevant or taught or within the spirit of the 144. Why is it a song within the spirit of the 144? Uh, other than could it be tied to the fact of the word that was hidden within their thoughts? Oh, OK. Just like we said here previously, it says that the father's name or his character is written in their foreheads. So there's a character of God. This means their song of praise and worship to God deals with the character of God that 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 nobody else has tapped into. Nobody else has got the frequency. Could it be? Could it be? Just like as we say, when a band comes together, you bring the trumpets, the trumpets bone, the baritone, the flute, uh, all of them have their own specific note. But when you bring them together, somebody got to really understand this. There's a harmonious sound that comes out that can't be duplicated by one of the instruments. It takes all of them to be put together to make that specific sound. So in that, if the 144,000 are of the 12 tribes, y'all got to hear this, then, then, then if all of them are symbolized a certain character or characteristic of God or a process that they went, they all were on a different frequency, but when they came together it was harmonious. Y'all get what I'm saying? Everybody can't sing it because there's too many notes in the part that can't be duplicated by one. So John says right here, he says, they sung as it were a new song before the throne. All right. Now they sung it before. Remember, the word throne comes from the Greek word thronos, which means the seat of power. So they sung it before the seat of power and before the four beasts. And as we remember, the four beasts are referenced in Revelation chapter four, verse six through nine, chapter five, verse six through 14, chapter six, one through eight, chapter 14 here in verse three. OK. So the four beasts, as we said, then coming from the Greek word zoom, which means four living beings. OK, uh, for some that may be new listening, let me even articulate that when we talk about living beings. What well, what's really being implied is these beings, whatever they may be, are beings that have uh, a flesh or have a body to them.
Amen. Because understand, as the, as the scriptures talk about heaven and the place in the dwelling place of God, everything is as we would understand it to being celestial. However, here as we talk about beasts, beasts imply animals or something that is of flesh or something that is wild or something of of I won't say the human nature, but of the physical nature. So there's four beings that are there who are of the physical nature and then it says and the elders i.e. the 24 old ones the ones who are aged in the Greek the presbyteros which is where we get presbytery even when it comes to uh, uh, some people by denominational belief presbyter uh, 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 which bottom line means elders those who are of age those who are mature those who are as we would say in today's terminology seasoned so they sang this song before the season, before the elders. They sang it before the four beasts. And then it says, and no man could learn that song. Okay? No man, and understand this, it didn't use the term uh, um, anthropos, which is for man, i.e., the physical. What it used was the term aldis, which means no one or nothing. So this is inclusive of not only a human being, but anything that was created. It says nothing was able to learn this song, i.e. in the learning, the Greek word for learn is manthano. Which doesn't just mean to learn, but it means to understand. Okay, so nobody could catch the jam because they couldn't understand what the jam was all about. Amen. Y'all have understood sometimes there, there has been in some of your lives when, when you've heard a song or so on the radio, you hear, you hear the music, but watch this. A lot of times either the words ain't clear or the words are clear. But as we say in 21st century, it seems like a bonics. The, the terminology that they're saying, you don't understand what, what, what they're saying or what they're implying. So the bottom line is uh, everything else other than those 144 didn't have a revelation of what was being said. The deep thing is there's revelation within revelation. Let me say that again. The book of Revelation got a revelation within the revelation. John sees that everybody uh, uh, had to determine there was something of a revelation that they had not been able to receive at this specific point point in the vision that God God has given John okay so it says no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth which were redeemed from the earth let's let's let, let's take a, a little moment and begin to look at, at, at what we're talking about or what is it implying when it talks about the redeemed from the earth all right the word redeemed comes uh, from the Greek word agrezo which means to purchase or to buy okay so the hundred and forty four were purchased from the earth or from the land or from the ground. There was a price that was paid for in order to obtain them. See, if we, if we remember back in Revelation chapter 7, it says the 144,000 had the seal of God, which means the mark. Uh, uh, the, 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 if I can even, even go there and say the Stephanos, the crown, the mark of God in their forehead. OK, once again, it says here, the mark of God that's in the forehead ties itself to what's written or what has been described or what has been downloaded in the cerebral when it is based on the word of God. All right. So now the hundred and forty four thousand have been purchased because watch this. Could it be that the word that they hid in their heart, i.e. in their thoughts added to the value? Oh, y'all got to hear what I'm saying. The more I get the word in me, the more valuable I become. 
Okay, the more I download the word of God or get it into my mind, engrave it into me, it increases my value. It's just like an investment. Y'all got to understand all of us were, were one of God's greatest investments. If God made us, if the if God, Yah, made us out of the Elohim. All right. He says you are one of the greatest investments that I can have in myself. So in that, watch this. Every piece of money that exists, no matter what culture it is, has a minimal value to it. Amen. But now when we talk about stock exchanges, when we when we talk about currency exchanges and so forth, based on each and every day or in some places based on the hour, it changes the value of the denomination of the currency. Hope I'm teaching somebody something right there. So if 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 man's currency can change by the hour, by the minute, if man's stocks can change by the hour or by the minute, if all of these things can 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 change in value, imagine how valuable you become and increase the more you put God in you. In the book of of of, of Psalms, it says, "Who is man that thou art mindful of him? God has a mind full of you." So it reminds you to have a mind full of God. The more I put God in my mind, the more I become uh, a, a like minded and come into the place of the greater value of who I am to him. Because, see, y'all got to understand, understand this. And I'm, I, I, I'm not trying to wing from the subject, but you got to understand why do we have a gospel other than to be under the God spell? What is the God spell other than your mind being able to be possessed fully by God? What is possession other? Other than being in a place that God becomes in the throne seat or the place of power in your head in order to operate you according to his will. Amen. Y'all know y'all are Bible readers. Samuel says disobedience is as under witchcraft. So what is witchcraft other than mind control? Mind, mind control that keeps you in a place of disobedience versus being in obedience. So that means you're under a spell of, of wickedness versus being under the spell of righteousness. God's gospel or good news. The Greek word for, for gospel is eungelium. Eungelium is, is, is the good news or the gospel that that is carried not only within the individual that believes on it and is delivered by it and receives it, but them being able to pass it along as a gift unto somebody else. So, so as 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 we really begin to understand this and hear what he what he's uh, 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 really saying, uh, it says that. The uh, 144,000 were redeemed or they were purchased because they were already valuable. See, people buy things because things have some value to them. OK, OK. Yeah. The, the reason the reason you buy a house is because the value it adds is you having somewhere to live. The reason you buy a car is the value it has. It can get you from A to B. Those those become, watch this, your necessities. They become things that you need, not just want. Now, now the things the things that you want is the quality of what you get. OK, but the things you need is the minimal necessity. Doesn't the scripture say God will supply all of our needs. He supplies the necessity. Okay. Uh, 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 so, so in the same turn, we add wants to the equation of the need. So in the same turn, he, he, he wants you because you need him. OK, as the need. Watch this. Watch this, because you, you think about it. You, we're only small version of him. In John 10, 34, Jesus says, is it not written that ye are gods and scripture can't be broken? Jesus referred to Psalms 82, 6 that calls you a God in the earth and the children are the most high. So in that we're a version of, of, of himself, not God himself, but we're versions or duplicates. So in that there is a need uh, and a want that is in the equation. 
Okay, so so now it talks about the 144,000 they were purchased because the value of them had had been increased based on what price they paid to have the word engrafted in them. Because in the same turn, uh, as everybody knows, we talk about saints throughout the book of Revelation, especially coming from the Greek word hagios. Hagios means sacred, but in order for something to be sacred, it had to go through a process. Okay, it had to go through as we would say apostolically a consecration which means there's a price of separation that had to occur so if they were sacred if they were saints okay the 144,000 were redeemed they were purchased because of being made a sacrifice in the process all right why do I say that why do I say that okay then now let's 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 begin to look at at verse 4 in verse 4 it says, uh, these are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the lamb, whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the lamb. Okay, now. Verse four, we began to get under, get into the understanding of what was the prerequisite or the qualification of the 144. So a lot of people talk about the 144, but they don't begin to look that there was a prerequisite. There was, there were, there were some requirements that had to be met in order for them to be chosen to fulfill the assignment of being those that represent the government and order and alignment of God. Those who can, who can represent being out of alignment and being brought into alignment in order for the greater good of the will of God. Now, here's as it says, verse four, these are they which were not defiled. All right. Now, the word defiled in the Greek is Milano, which means to soil, meaning these were, were they which were not uh, made dirty with women okay the word woman there is gune depending on the translation it's talking about either woman or wife for they are virgins now i know some are saying right there apostle okay so are you telling us the 144 uh are only men okay in the literal translation People would say yes. If we took that from the Antiochian uh, hermeneutics of teaching, we would say, yeah, it's only 144,000 men that were chosen. However, I, 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 I'm not going to go there and say that is the only understanding or the revelation of the text. Because in that, understand, what are we being delivered from other than our sin? What are we being delivered from as believers other than our iniquity? Okay. What are we being delivered from that, that has been, uh, uh, conduits to make us sin and iniquit, uh, do iniquity or should I say unrighteous practices other than paganism that stemmed itself back in the old Testament. Okay. Now, where I'm going with this, where I'm going with this is I have to make sure that you have some also cultural understanding because with cultural understanding of a lot of things that are said, it'll give you a revelation uh, uh, that'll carry you in a greater place. Now, in saying that, the reason I, I, I'm dropping this in your hearing is the fact that when we go back to the Old Testament, when it came to the idolatry and the paganism that was practiced by priests in temples, one of the practices that they did in order to worship the pagan God that they were giving honor to was doing uh, 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 sexual acts with women. All right. Now, we as a Western world, we 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 call uh, uh, women that 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 are on the street different terms like harlots, whore. Uh, we, we use all these different terminologies. However, the thing is, when we go back and look at it scripture wise, it wasn't that a woman was on the street corners dealing with a lot of men being familiar with them. All right. By the scriptures and the culture, it was them doing their due duty 
as part of the worship of a pagan god. The priests had them. Okay, so now watch this. If the priests were of temples, they were supposed to be the representative of the God of the temple that they were keeping. Whether they were worshiping the living God or they were worshiping a pagan God, they were considered the righteous ones to represent the deity of the temple. So in that, they would uh, uh, have women as part of their worship to their deity. So in that, I'm giving you a deeper spiritual revelation. What he's saying here on the spiritual side, as we would say, the Alexandrian hermeneutics of it. These are 144,000 individuals that had not intermingled themselves with paganism. These were 144,000 that had not subject themselves or been seduced with the ways of the pagans. Amen. You see, even as we began to understand how the prophets were, were, uh, 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 Put to death, Old Testament wise, by pagan, 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 pagan women, pagan spirits, and so forth. The, the 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 thing is, these were those who had not allowed themselves to be seduced with the paganism of worshiping false gods. They were virgins, meaning they were unmingled. They were unmixed. We look at virgin only in one aspect of being unmarried of not or not having any intimate activity. But in the same term, we look at that spiritually. It's not talking about intimate activity with somebody else. It's talking about being intimate with another God or with another pagan God. Uh, because uh, uh, God says he alone is God. So everything else is only a pagan version or an image or a representation of a wannabe that wants to be God. So he says we should be spiritual virgins by not intermingling and submitting to pagan gods. Amen. So so in that he says he says here. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. All right. These are they which follow the lamb, whithersoever he goeth. All right. Okay. So it really tells you these are they that are virgins because they follow the lamb. They don't follow what has been uh, uh, given as far as uh, uh, minor versions of God or the lesser, you know, it, you know, in the natural, we usually say the lesser of the sex. The woman is the lesser, the lesser of the male, which I'm not I'm not throwing that swerve here on the Bible. Side, but I'm trying to make a point so you can really grab grab what I'm saying. So any false version of a God is the lesser. All right. So the thing is, they weren't chasing after after anything and everything from the streets of, of a false version of a God because they were chasing after the lamb, the one true version or replicated smaller version of God, i.e. the Christ. So as 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 they chased after what was the true, then it kept them honest in the relationship. Uh, Y'all feel what I'm saying? It, it, everybody that's married, when you when you submitted to your other one, even in the process of before marrying, you you courted them, and they was the only thing that you had your eye focused on if you were in right standing with God in how you treated relationships. You weren't you weren't trying to chase after anybody and everybody and trying to pick from a group. You had your, your eyes set on one. So what happens is the more that you became focused on one individual, one significant other, the less every everybody else mattered. So so in that these were focused on Christ. These were focused on the Lamb. These were focused on the one that was slaughtered innocently amen because you if you think about it even when it comes to relationships all of us would love to have an intimate relationship with somebody that was innocent we we look for the innocence we look for the innocence so 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 the hundred forty four thousand kept themselves pure from falling into the trap of pagan gods because they were following what was innocent and what was true 
Okay? So this says they followed him wherever he went. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. All right? So now it says they came from among men. Now, notice that I said here in verse 3, man that's used there is aldis, but here in verse 4, the word for men is anthropos. Okay, two different words. All right, so it's a, when it says anthropos, it means from human beings. So the hundred forty-four thousand ain't ain't somebody uh, 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 supernatural as we would think, or something, something, or someone out of this world. It says they came from among us that were human beings. They were chosen ones. They, they came from us. It says they came from among men, i.e. anthropos, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb, meaning that they were sacrificial. When we say first fruits, the Greek word for, for first fruits is aparke, which means the beginning of sacrifice. Amen. You, you think about it. Christ died on the cross for us 2000 years ago, as we believe. So he was the innocent sacrifice. Well, in the same turn, you got to understand that we even understand in the natural what's called the bartering system. Uh, uh, in order to get, you have to give. God is a God of righteousness or justification. So that means there has to be an equal exchange so since he gave his life for us now it's time for us to give our lives back to him so the 144,000 were those who had been redeemed y'all 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 hear what I'm saying because they were the beginning of sacrifice they first 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 hand gave themselves in order to be with him they gave their lives Hear what I'm saying. They, they sacrifice the ways of the world in order to do the ways of God. They sacrifice following paganism in order to follow righteousness. Due to their sacrifice that began in their mind, it began in their thoughts. Now it made them acceptable or redeemable unto God. See, the thing is, we, we, when we say we give our life to Christ, it's the beginning step of being the first fruits. Hopefully I'm giving a revelation to somebody. It's, it's the beginning. I know we're right there of the hour, but it is the beginning of being the first fruits unto God. It, it, there's a sacrifice, meaning a changing of the mind. There has to be a conversion and a word that's going inside the mind. So, so here they have given themselves unto God. And so now he says, I redeem you. I purchase you from the earth. And so they, they are first fruits, not only to God, to Theos, to the divine, but they're also first fruits unto the lamb, which means the beginning of sacrifice for the conversion. You, you know, Paul. Paul says, be ye transformed, all right, by the renewing of your mind. What he's talking about is, you know, watch this as a revelation that ties itself to what John is saying here. There's a transformation that begins to occur. The transformation is with you, even in your body that you're dealing with right now. So the 144 had a transformation in their mind and a transformation of their identity based on the character of God that was already in their head. So, so now we begin to understand this is what, what, what begins to, to transcend here when we understand about the redeemed. This is where, where we really get a deep revelation about being redeemed or the process of redemption that we've even talked about in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Here's where the power punch of understanding the redemption process because it, it, it validates itself as we have spoken here uh, and come back to the 144,000 that were talked about in Revelation chapter 7. Now we understand on a deeper note what was the, uh, the prerequisites of their choosing in order for them to be selected to be redeemed. Amen. Amen.